Hello everyone and welcome back to Water Child Tarot. My name is Sarah and today I am very excited to introduce a new series that I've been thinking about, pondering, working on, gathering notes for over a year to make. Um, so today we're going to kick off the series on numerology and I've hinted at this a number of times um, before but I wanted to give you an overview of what my goal is for this series in in this first part and then we're just going to start with the aces for this video i will do two three and four in a, in the second video five six and seven in the third video and eight nine and ten in the final video um, and my goal with this has come out of a of a desire of a need for myself really and so it's not meant to be prescriptive in any way or that I think this is correct or better than any other way of looking at numerology and tarot. I should say specifically I'm looking at the pips, the one through ten of each of the four suits. Um, but it is a, a goal of mine to explore this topic in a lot of detail and I have given a lot of thought and also through a lot of readings that I've done, you know, played around with some of these ideas. Um, so when I started learning tarot, it seemed to me that it should be significant if you're going to number a card that those numbers should mean something. Um, otherwise, why bother putting a number on it, right? But I've always had trouble reconciling the numbers with the pictures and especially the Golden Dawn titles for the cards. Um, if you don't know about the Golden Dawn, they were a secret society. And A.E. Waite, the um, producer of the Rider Waite Smith deck, um, the art director, if you will, or conceptualizer of that deck, had very specific ideas about what he wanted to put into his deck and, you know, directed some of the imagery of Pamela Coleman Smith, the artist behind it. And the decisions that they made, you know, whether Pamela Coleman Smith may have had made some of her own decisions um, because A.E. Waite wasn't as concerned with the 1 through 10, I don't know. Um, but that the decisions that they made overall just don't seem to be very consistent across the 1 through 10. So what I want to do is make sense of those pictures, look at the keywords from the Golden Dawn, which influenced the pictures that Waite chose for the deck, and then try to figure out how to amalgamate some kind of more cohesive numerological pattern from that. The Golden Dawn keywords are particularly problematic and they influence the pictures. Um, and they're inconsistent in a number of ways. They're inconsistent if you look at, for example, you know, all of the twos or all of the threes together, they're inconsistent as to positive or negative connotation. So you don't get you know, threes are generally good, fives are generally difficult all the time. Um, on, on, in some cases, you do get more of a leaning one way or another, but you don't always get that consistency. Sometimes they're um, inconsistent in terms of the topic that they're talking about, and sometimes even the part of speech. And we'll get into that more as we look at some of these specifics. So I'm trying, I'm trying to tease out some kind of a pattern without actually contravening the image entirely, right? If you're going to read with a modern tarot deck, it's probably going to be RWS based in some, in many ways, and you can't. I believe strongly that you can't lay down cards on the table and then say something about them that completely doesn't go with any of the images, that, that comes out of left field because you've memorized some other set of associations. You have to tie it back in with the image if you're going to use pictorial or scenic decks. So how can we reconcile then a, a, a series of pictures that don't seem to have a strong pattern, a strong theme throughout the numbers with a desire to have more of a theme throughout the numbers. How can we do that effectively? And then, so I want to look at mainly the RWS for this exercise, but I will be bringing in some favorite examples from other decks that are also um, scenic and just kind of comparing, you know, some, some other interpretations that I think maybe fit better or perhaps express the numerological impulse a little bit more clearly. That's what we're going to do. And I'm going to also be comparing the pips, the one through 10, with their corresponding trump cards, because we also, in the 22 major arcana, if you want to call them that, or trumps, you have 
1 through 10, and then you have 11 through 21. And how do we, you know, make sense of those being numbered at all as well? Um, I think in a lot of cases it's sort of difficult to do that, but I've come around in some cases to, to being able to kind of creatively think, think through that as well. So again, none of this is meant to be definitive. You don't have to like this <laughs> stuff that I'm talking about. You don't have to agree with me. Um, and I'm very curious if you've done something similar for yourself in your own tarot explorations, or you know, maybe this isn't very um, important to you. You just go by what the pictures look like, or you just go by keywords that you memorized, and you know the numbering isn't as important. I would love to hear that because um, I think there are many different effective ways to read. One other thing I wanted to mention before we start looking at cards is that, you know, historically, a lot of tarot decks were not fully pictorial. They had symbol suits on the numbered cards, and then the only pictures were of figures in the court cards and the trumps. And this kind of card is a lot easier, it's a lot more open to read, to interpretation, and to say whatever you want than say, the Two of Wands from the RWS with the guy standing, holding a wand and holding a globe in his hand. That picture is much more specific, even though it's open to interpretation. Um, that picture is much more sp specific than this kind of a card. And so how can we work within that and still have it make a certain amount of sense? How can we be flexible in our reading and adapt the reading to the subject matter or to the question, but again, using the image rather than having to sort of apologize for and sweep the image away like well yeah he's standing there with a globe but that doesn't really mean anything in this reading you know you, you, I, I think that's very clunky and it can be very confusing for someone receiving a reading especially if they don't also read and study tarot of themselves i need to also mention that there are two different ways you can read increasing numbers and i tend to follow a pythagorean numerological way of reading as a progression through a process or developing additional skills, developing um, as a person over time. Um, there is another way though that is more cardomantic, it's my, maybe a little bit more historical, and that is to assign qualities to each suit and then the number just becomes an order of magnitude. You know, one is very concentrated or small, two is a little bit more, three is a little bit more, and so on. So in that case, you would have, say, like swords would be, or spades would be the worst suit, right? It would be terrible news. Clubs or wands would be slightly not as bad, but possibly filled with, you know, confusion or conflict. And then you would have, you know, a little bit or a lot of that. Um, diamonds or pentacles would be, you know, more improved, uh, more favorable. And then hearts would be most favorable or, or most pleasurable. Um, and then you would have just a magnitude of that experience. So a little bit of pleasure, a lot of pleasure, right? Um, that's not really how I read tarot. And I'm not much of a cardomantic reader. I, I've read about it, but I've never really done much with playing cards. So my approach in these videos is going to be more of the former, which is having each number assigned to kind of a stage of growth or an opportunity or um, a set of experiences, a set of possible experiences that you may be having at that stage. And this will become more clear as I dive into um, the two through 10, but I wanted to mention that and, and distinguish it um, as to my goal uh, in, in this video. All right, so with those preambles and uh, qualifiers um, taken care of, and hopefully I've made myself clear as to, to what my intentions are, let's go down and look at some cards. All right, so here we have aces or ones, and of course we're gonna start with the magician as our primary trump, uh, labeled number one. Now, in the Rider-Waite-Smith, we have the magician. This is the Golden Dawn title for this card, and the Golden Dawn, um, title for the magician is the magus of power so they've imbued this card with a lot of heft and weight behind it you know crowley was obsessed with um the ego and and you know sort of taking back your power and constructing your own persona and all of this but historically the magician or the juggler or the battleur 
he was sort of like the fool. He was like a step up from the fool. So the fool is an idiot, right, who is mocked. He's an outcast in society, doesn't fit. Um, he's also a free spirit for that reason, because he doesn't fit into a system. Um, but the magician is really a street magician. The bachelor is someone you meet on a street corner. They're a con artist. They're a performer, an entertainer, um, someone who can both uh, give you pleasure, but also take your purse, you know, swindle you out of your hard-earned money. Um, that is that is the, the role and the, and the aspect of magician. So it's an interesting thing to think about this this powerful and sacred sort of uh, position that the Golden Dawn takes, and then this this other side that is a lot less serious and a lot less um, formidable and also a lot less respected in society when we think about aces. Um, the Golden Dawn titles for the aces themselves are simply the root of the powers of whatever element it is, right? So the Ace of Wands is the root of the power of fire, the root of the power of water, power of air, power of earth. Um, so that doesn't give us much to go on. And, and fortunately, um, at least with the aces, the Golden Dawn stays pretty consistent in what they're calling these things. But it doesn't give us a lot to go off of. So in my own explorations of the number one and you know what it can signify, how it can play out in a reading, um, I've, I've come to use and enjoy a lot of keywords that we're probably familiar with, right? Seed. Um, spark. I think of the magician himself or herself as an instigator, someone who tries things, someone who kind of just goes for it, not in the naive way of the fool, but in a more uh, more confident way. You know, yes, I can do this. Bippity boppity boo, this is going to manifest, right? All you manifestors out there, this is your manifesting kind of energy card. Um, but the ace can signify other things. It can signify um, the seed of an idea, and the opportunity for something to happen, but you don't know how it's going to turn out, right? You can plant a seed and maybe it will sprout if the causes and conditions are right around that. But if the causes and conditions are not right, the seed is just gonna rot in the ground or get dug up and eaten by an animal or something like that. Um, aces can refer to an idea or a hint, but again, you know, you drop a hint and the other person doesn't get your hint and then nothing comes of it. You know, you can hint to someone that you are attracted to them or that you'd like something in particular for your birthday or whatever, but it doesn't always happen. So that's ace energy. It's, 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 and it ties back into that trickster energy of, you know, the battler um, where you're not sure if you're going to get what you want or not. You're not sure it's going to actually happen. It's the idea. It's the it's the thrill of, you know, playing cards in a casino, but you don't know if you're going to win or not. Um, it is the smallest number, but it's also the most concentrated number. And we see that sometimes in Marseille imagery where you'll have um, a really big item. Even here, you kind of see that, you know, this is a massive, if we look at the landscape behind, this is a massive wand. It's a massive overflowing cup, right? This is a huge sword and a pentacle bigger than your house. So um, it's not, it's not necessarily the smallest. It could actually be in some ways the largest or the most concentrated. It, it summarizes all of the power of the suit into one item. And then, as I was saying before, aces can have that kind of mirage quality. Like you see it, or you think of that thought, or you have that feeling, or you have that urge, but then it sort of goes away, it goes poof, you know, you forget about it. The microwave beeps, and then you're off to the next thing, and you forgot what you were going to do next. So that kind of ethereal or uh, transitory property of the aces. And then also, I think it can point to a certain kind of vulnerability. When we're opening ourselves to a new experience, when we're trying something new, when we're attempting something we haven't done before, we feel vulnerable doing that. And we sort of need that vulnerability. We need to be open in order to have a new experience. So if this is an opportunity, a gift, a seed, a start, a whatever, you have to be open to that and you have to be a little bit vulnerable um, and you might get, again, taken advantage of, right? You step up to the table to play the cup and balls and the magician is there doing his patter and, you know, enticing you and wowing you with his skillful handling of his implements. And 
you know, you get kind of sucked in. And so that's also that kind of ACE experience of like, ooh, what is this? And then you kind of open yourself up to it and maybe it goes great and maybe you get taken advantage of. That's kind of what ACEs are um, for me anyway. Um, and, you know, generally I do see them as fairly positive, but again, it can be, it can be positivity that's overlooked. It can be positivity that doesn't come to fruition. It's an opportunity that doesn't um, actually manifest into anything. If we look at the 11 position in the Rider-Waite-Smith, we have justice. And it's a little bit hard at first to reconcile. Um, I think I think 11 through 20 are kind of harder to reconcile with 1 through 10 than they ought to be. I think if, if I were in charge, it would be different, but um, I'm not in charge. So I don't know. What can we do with justice and the magician? And I think here, if we have confusion over here and that kind of ethereal not sure what's going to happen. Here we can have kind of a reckoning and saying, okay, aces are where we really have to kind of stick the point. We have to go back to basics. We have to re uh, reevaluate in a way. Um, there are other cards that I look at for reevaluation as well, but sort of start over, you know, um, clean slate. You know, maybe justice is about like forgetting what happened in the past, letting go of our baggage, cutting, cutting clean and starting anew. And so I think there are some parallels here between um, these two majors and then what the aces can signify in a reading. Um, there's not a ton to actually reconcile with any of these, you know, ideas or keywords or whatever um, in this imagery. But as we get through to the two through ten, we will certainly have more to kind of um, play with and also figure out. So as I mentioned, I also wanted to compare that imagery we were just looking at with some other imagery from more modern decks. These are two of the aces from the Fifth Spirit Tarot by Charlie Claire Burgess. And I like these two specifically for that kind of potential energy that I was mentioning. So on the left you have the Ace of Fire or the Ace of Wands. And I like this image of a lighter specifically because um, it, it could also have been a match perhaps. but. We all know that that experience of trying to light a lighter and you go flick, flick, and then whoosh, and then it actually catches, right? So those first couple of flicks, you know, that's that's an ace, like, not doing its thing. And then, of course, you get the lighter lit, but then you have to light something. Um, you're not just going to stand there holding the lighter forever, maybe for a moment if you're at a concert. Um, but otherwise, you know, this is something that's, that's ephemeral. It's there, and then it's not there. Um, and yet it's totally necessary if you're going to start a fire, right? You have to have that spark in order to light a candle, light a campfire, light something else. So that's a good um, sort of practical illustration of, of how aces work and what they can do. Um, same thing with this bulb. Um, is this an amaryllis? I'm not sure. Um, but this bulb, you know, it wants to sprout, it's trying to sprout, but it's not actually planted in the ground. It's hovering above the ground, sort of supported by this hand. So it needs something. It needs water, it needs earth, it needs perhaps someone or some kind of animal to dig a hole and plant it. Um, it needs all the right causes and conditions in order to bloom into whatever it's supposed to turn into. Um, so those are those are good analogies. Um, similarly, we have these couple of aces from the Tarot of Mystical Moments by Katrin Waltstein. On the left, we have the Ace of Wands, again, the fire um, suit. And then on the right, we have the Ace of Swords in this deck. Um, I like these because they show people. Um, and I, I really love the art style of this deck in general. Uh, this is interesting because, you know, you might associate maybe books and reading with an earthy pursuit, but I, I associate wands um, with, you know, our passion, our desire to learn, our desire, desire to explore the world. And one way we can do that is through reading and through research. So I really like this this idea of like you're cracking the book, but you're not actually looking into the book yet. So the book has this potential if you read it, but if you just have it on a shelf or you just have it as a prop on your desk, um, you're not actually getting the benefit of having that book. And then the same thing, the Ace of Swords. Um, this is really beautiful, and it has um, this this hidden detail. Um, that maybe stands out to you, but it, it took me a while to find this little keyhole in this person's um, sort of headdress. So she has this uh, Nautilus style headdress, and then in the center of the spiral is a keyhole, and she's holding a key. 
Um, and so unlocking your mind is the phrase that comes to me when I look at this image, um, or one of them. And so how can you get unstuck from your tendencies, your habitual thoughts, you know, your, um, your biases, your prior experience, you know, we all have those mental blocks sometimes that prevent us from growing as people, from prevent us from even receiving new information. We talk about confirmation bias, right? And how when you get new information, um, if it doesn't jive with your worldview or the way that you've thought about things in the past, you just reject it and you say, no, that's not true. That's not applicable. Um, I'm going to ignore that information. But if you can be more open-minded and, you know, unlock your own brain essentially and receive this information, then you have that potential to learn um, and to expand your mind and to expand your thinking. So I just thought those were some cool examples from other tarots. And um, yeah, again, I'd love to know if you have other imagery for aces that you particularly like. Yeah, so that's all I have for you uh, for the short introduction. I want to say thank you for um, coming along on this ride with me. And again, I would love to hear your ideas of how you work with numbers in tarot if you do it all or again whether you know that's less important to you than maybe the images or keywords or things like that let me know how you um, work with this and i'll see you next time for the next installment thanks and take care